So uh, welcome one and all to the Bowen online session. Some of you know very well what goes on here and some of you it's lovely to see you for the first time. Um, you're always welcome to come back if uh, anything that we're doing appeals. I always post it on Facebook. Um, I suspect that everybody here knows Jamie fairly well, either because she's been contributing to these sessions for about the last nine months, um, or because you know her from the prolific work she does in the Aikido world. Um, but I think we should start with uh, Jamie just providing a little bit of background about her story, really. So Jamie, start us where I know that you found Aikido at university from a friend who said, oh, you should try this stuff out. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're gonna sort of unpack Aikido today. Um, I discovered Aikido when I was 21. Uh, mind you, I was a Midwest girl, so never heard of anything Eastern, uh, anything about self-defense, anything about martial arts. Uh, I didn't even know what uh, self-development was. I didn't know what therapy was. I didn't know what anything was uh, too much at that point in time. Also, I'm old enough, this was way back when. <laughs> so we're talking kind of early 70s-ish. But I had started playing golf, which will come into the picture, when I was seven years old. And I was a very natural golfer. In fact, I became a state national junior golf champion, had tour potential. And then I was accepted to school at Stanford University, which was awesome, except in the States, that was before this thing called Title IX came, uh, it was passed through Congress, which gave equal funding to girls in sports, you know, girls and young women sports teams. And so here, here I am like ranked in the top 10 nationally and I didn't have a golf scholarship. So I, and I had other reasons for losing interest in golf at the time. And then my um, uh, two of my best friends, actually my first two girlfriends uh, knew about Aikido when, uh, and were doing it. So they told me about it and, you know, honest to gosh, I shouldn't even say this publicly, but I will. Um, so it was, uh, 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 we were doing what, I guess it's called ecstasy now, but it was like the, one of the only drug trips I ever did, right? And uh, my friends tell me, she's showing me this and I'm like totally confused. And she's telling me about this incredible martial art that's all about uh, flow and the teacher speaks in metaphors of nature. The teacher of course was Frank Duran Sensei. He was teaching five days a week at Stanford uh, and you could get a college credit. And that it was this cooperative, not competitive environment and everybody really helped each other and it was so much fun. Uh, Joan Baez started to train at Stanford. She lived nearby. So I just thought, oh, that was way too good to be true. You know, we were, we were high or something. <laughs> and uh, so I went to class January 3rd. So I just had my 45th anniversary. And as she, I just went very cynically and discovered that it was just as good as she had said. So I just dove headlong into Aikido and was uh, actually, I got to train probably 10 times a week, five days a week, noon. And Duran Sensei was teaching at what became Aikido West. And he also taught in San Francisco. So I was just training all the time. Bay Area was kind of Aiki Mecca. So I got to train with, uh, in uh, Iwama style with Bill Witt Sensei and um, uh, Nado Sensei was teaching. So we kind of got it, you know, all these different dimensions of Aikido. It was a great, great period of time. And then I opened my own dojo when I was 25. <clears throat> I wouldn't have done it except that oh, say, so let, me ask, school. let me ask a question so uh, yep. when you first started your training mm -hmm. I mean, you were quite an athletic person anyway was it the athleticism and the sporting side that grabbed you or was it something else about Aikido that you immediately saw and, and, and felt deeply attracted to great question Quinton I think it was a combo of that it was I love the philosophy of peace this was at the time, if, I mean, you have to put everything in historical context. So this was kind of uh, the Vietnam War moratoriums, big protest and the Vietnam War in America. Um, and <clears throat> I had a lot of consciousness around uh, early on, racism, sexism, all of these things, inequalities. And so I, I love the philosophy. And, uh, and of course I love the athleticism. And I think it kind of spoke to what I, then got words for spirituality and philosophy and you know all of these things but it was kind of all of the above and honestly uh, to bring in the golf thing the first I don't know four years of Aikido I kept feeling like that feeling on the tip of your tongue it was on the tip of my whole body that I knew it it, it all felt familiar 
And so it really came from golf because here I've been, you know, holding a golf club and then here's a, a sword and Kokunage is the backswing and Kokunage, you know, forward is the forward swing. Um, so, you know, it all just kind of, I, I didn't realize what it was, why it was so familiar, but it was. And then Aikido really gave me, which I'll, I'll talk about today, sort of the generic principles that helped me understand why I was sort of a natural at golf and even with no no instruction because it was all this centeredness and balance and evenness and flow and focus and you know all those things so again I, I got the articulation on it later but something in me kind of felt it and knew it okay so did you graduate at Stanford I did I did right okay so high achieving grad if you went to Stanford kind of have to be mm -hmm. uh yeah. what were your aspirations for your career at that stage uh I you know I actually, I'll tell you the truth, I thought I was going to, I was, I had been studying Hebrew, I'd been to Israel, I studied French, I was studying uh, Russian, and <clears throat> so my plan actually at the time was to uh, help get the Soviet Jews out of Russia, and they would stop at way stations in Europe, and then I could send them to Europe or America or Israel or whatever, that was my, era, my plan, but uh, that all changed radically, and that's not really what I did, but I studied I studied a lot of social science, uh, political economics, uh, history, things like that, languages. Yeah. So, um, okay. and then what happened? Uh, well, I'll just. I was just going to say, I mean, you might be able to say it, but I was just going to say, well, okay, so the realities of life came along. You had to earn it. Yeah, yeah right. What did she do? <laughs> well, no. So, what happened? And it's, it's an interesting thing that happened. So, here I am. Um, I opened my own dojo, the Women's Aikido School of San Francisco. Um, I had gotten involved with women uh, martial artists and that was the beginnings of the women's martial arts movement. And I just met some women who were doing martial arts and we connected not about our art because they did mostly karate and all kinds of other arts, but as martial artists. And that's when all this awareness around empowerment and uh, you know, self-defense and dealing with you know, take back the night and sexual abuse and all of these things, racism came in and um, empowerment through martial arts. So some women asked me to teach and then I opened my dojo. Um, and meanwhile, so, uh, I would always, we would always massage each other after class. You guys probably do that, right? Everything hurts. <laughs> and uh, people said, you got great hands. And at the time, I probably all know of uh, Richard uh, Strozzi Heckler and Wendy Palmer. They were part of the, something called the Lomi School. And the Lomi School blended Aikido and yoga and conscious movement with psychology and Gestalt therapy and Reiki and breath work and meditation, polarity therapy. So, and again, this is kind of like the 70s and all this stuff is happening. It's happening in the Bay Area, holistic, somatic psychology. And uh, they were doing uh, 13 week trainings. They said, you should go to Lomi School because I already had Aikido and I had good hands. So off I went and I did the training. Um, it was one of those crazy California experiences, right? 13 weeks living together and we were our own clients and own students. But when we studied anatomy, we studied body work, we dissected cadavers at uh, UCSF and uh, University in San Francisco. And then I did my master's degree in clinical psychology. So that's how all of those things came into play for me. And I really got into body work and psychology and just uh, the whole somatic approach to everything. And with Aikido as, as kind of this through line through it. So, so um, take us from there, really. Well, from there, so many things happened. Having my school was awesome. That really helped me to learn to teach. And uh, just in, in my training continued all along the way. And then in 1987, a pivotal thing happened. I was trained with Barish Sensei. And uh, the, we had this opportunity. It was the Gorbachev years. And the Soviet Union was just opening up. Uh, called Glasnost, Perestroika, restructuring, and all of a sudden we could go to the Soviet Union. And so Bear Sensei called me up, he was bringing 35 people to the uh, ex-Soviet Union. Uh, Jim Alvarez was on that trip, uh, David Weinstock was on that trip, and off we went for two weeks to, to Russia. And at the time, of course, that was the Cold War. Uh, between the Soviets and the Americans. And so we, it was that enemy thing, right? And <clears throat> we got off the airplane. It was pretty intimidating. I must say it was still kind of like, uh, <laughs> kind of the gulag was still there. Um, but, uh, you know, we connected through Aikido and we were disillusioned of our fears and stereotypes of each other through that personal contact. And then of course, the practice of Aikido, well, the, the philosophy of Aikido and the practice. I mean, we actually got to touch. When you get to touch and quickly, your enemies, 
and to have a good time and to blend and roll around and laugh and learn. And, uh, and then they, we would tourist around. I have so many images of uh, like going to, to uh, Red Square and seeing the Kremlin and all that stuff. And the Russians are like walking behind us and they've got their Joe and they're going like this and like this. And they're like, and then they go, oh, excuse us, uh, could we ask you a question? So they were like training. They were soaking up, sucking up everything they possibly could. And it was just a, a very life-changing experience in the most positive way. So then I led a number of groups, a um, number of trips in 1989, 1991. In fact, I can send, we have a documentary from the 1991 trip and we went into schools and we did all kinds of cool things and we just trained and trained and trained. So this was actually the beginnings of uh, Aikido in the Soviet Union. And for me, it was the beginning of using Aikido as a vehicle for peace and to connect people. And to really do what O Sensei was talking about, which is like work with your enemies, you know, get to know your enemies, make friends of your enemies through the art of peace in the most literal way. And then, you know, I've been going to, to um, Israel since I was 17. I actually took off my sec, uh, second half of uh, my senior year in high school. I, I already finished high school. And so I went off to Israel for six months when I was 17 and was learning Hebrew and farming, the whole kibbutz thing. So I had all these deep ties to Israel. And uh, in 1992, I started going back there and teaching and uh, ended up moving there in the mid nineties. And you know, out of that was eventually born the Middle East Aikido Project, Training Across Borders. But the background for me was actually um, the work in the Soviet Union. I was going to say, it sounded like the first training across borders, really. Yeah, you know, it, it really, it really was. And the thing about that was it really showed me how powerful, or what a powerful vehicle Aikido is to connect people, um, you know, in a, in a real way. And, and that's what I would kind of want to talk about today, too, is both sort of the philosophy, but making the philosophy of Aikido really practical. Okay. So we come down from sort of the spiritual clouds or these beautiful words and philosophies and really make this very practical in our lives, which is what I think we do in Aiki Extensions. It's how do we make Aikido practical so it makes a difference in our lives. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. I, I was reading a post on Facebook today uh, where somebody had said Aikido is the art of peace and somebody else had just said, well, that was just a translation by John Stephen that it's not correct, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I, I kind of, personally, I, I get a bit irritated when I read posts like that. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about what Aikido means to you, the translation of that word and why you feel that was, that's what Osensi was on about, as opposed to this interpretation that really it's, it's based in the martial. Yeah, well, I want to, I will talk about that Aiki and Do. I think it's important. And uh, if anybody's ever trained with me, wherever I train, I, at most every class I kind of start with, well, you know, after 40, 45 years now on the mat, I'm still working on Aiki and Do. And so that's what we're going to be working with. And I think that's important. So, um, you know, I sort of wanted to unpack the big word today, unpack Aiki and Do. Um, and I am writing a book about all this. So um, let's start with I, okay? So I, you know, peace. But I, uh, Japanese, Chinese, you know, love, we say, commonly say I means love. What's love, you know, or, and is it really love? But love, harmony, unity, oneness, joining, coming together. So to me, that's kind of what I is about. And uh, <clears throat> let, let me give a bigger background to this. And I think O Sensei was talking about it, is that I think we have to look at oneness, all right? And again, we're going to talk kind of, you know, these big words, but how, well, how does that make a difference or what does that mean? So it's basically this idea, even the uh, quantum physicists that work with the idea that there was, there's a, a one energy, uh, even the Big Bang Theory isn't the best theory that uh, even the quantum physicists have for the start of the universe, right? But so there's this universe, una being the one, right? And um, we have multiverses within the universe, but there's this one big giant energy of the universe, okay? And not like, ooh, the energy of the universe, but no, really, we live in this big universe and there's one energy and it, it's everywhere and it manifests in everything. So we have this oneness and uh, the Confucians uh, can, uh, talk about the 10,000 things, the Chinese, the, the 10,000 things is like the shorthand for there's this one giant energy everywhere that everything then a formlessness that takes form in 10,000 things, meaning all of the 
you know, 10 million zillion things of uh, forms that life can take and that the form and then lose their form that are born and then they die, right? So we have this form, uh, the body and there, you know, everything has a form and even planets, you know, they die after they get born. The planets and stars have it, whether they live for 20 billion years or whatever, but so they form and then they lose form. So we have this 10,000 things, this diversity, this multiplicity, all out of this one energy. And I think that that's a really important thing to, to have as, a, as the backdrop. And so when we say we're all one or that what's in me is in you, and we know that, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are or what nationality you are, or what religion you are. These are the things we found, right? So it's Americans got together or Palestinians, is right. it doesn't matter, but you know, we're all the same, gay and straight. If we really got, you know, black and white, if we really got that we're made of the same stuff and we live in the same stuff, that would make a difference. So when we talk about unity consciousness and these things can sound kind of new agey, but I think they're really practical. And we can see here in the states, right, and even around the world, but let's take the states at the moment, right, the reds and the blues, the Republicans and the Democrats, I mean, we're at war. We have a world that is so divided. We have country within our country, civil war, um, you know, we, uh, relationships, right, you and your partner are at war. I mean, there's just so much division and so much imbalance and so much hatred, not I. This is the opposite of I. And we see that a lot of uh, violence and destruction happens. We have climate, um, you know, <laughs> peril going on because we're we're not in a consciousness that then leads us to act in oneness, you know, with love, with connection, uh, with care, with empathy, with identification with the other. And so. This is another thing that this oneness, right? It manifests in 10,000 ways. It also manifests with what look like opposites and polarities and dualities. And we really believe them, right? We think they're opposite. And we've been talking here a lot about yin and yang. So that as if they're different and they are different, right? Well, things manifest differently, but they're connected. They're on continuums, they're on spectrums, they're related. And we can visit parts of the spectrum, but we can't forget that they're, you know, it's like the teeter totter, right? And you need the teeter to have the totter. There's no game, there's no seesaw. Uh, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, dynamic tension, everything is born from this interplay of these opposites uh, or seeming opposites. And so this is where our, our awareness of oneness and appreciation of 10,000 things or of yin and yang or of these dualities, but that they're related. And when we can find the relationship, we can start managing our way uh, or negotiating our way through life better um, with and appreciating, you know, the light and the dark and day and night and, you know, I'm well, I'm injured. I mean, it, I mean, so many different things. And I think that that is really helpful. So I like to think about uh, koan, right? Koan is like, hmm, what's the sound of one hand clapping, which is an interesting one. We, we need two hands to clap, right? Uh, how do you eat with one chopstick? It's like, we actually need the two. Or if you think about, I call it the coin koan. I've been writing about this, you know, heads and tails. But the truth is, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're one. They're absolutely one. And they face the other way. They seem different, but they're one. So you can just feel that in your own body right now. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, you have the front side of your body you have the backside. I mean, you couldn't have, you have them, you just do. Even something as thin as a piece of hair or a thin coin has both. You know, you have the left and right side. We have an up and we have a down. And one's not better or worse and you can't have one without the other. It's just the way things are made. So we can start to, you know, not take differences and dualities as things that have to lead us into big fights. Or if they do, when we have conflict, we can look for, well, where's that, Where's that connection? And how can we appreciate that even within our difference, we're in this bigger oneness? So I hope I'm making sense that this is really important and it's very, very practical if we're gonna solve any of our problems in the world, okay. right? Our conflicts, our wars, um, we're all facing a global pandemic. We've all got a climate crisis. We've got, I mean, there's lots of immigrants and refugees. There's only gonna be more. Uh, we've got, it, just from the climate, forget anything else. So people are moving around all the time. And how do we, um, if not embrace the other, at least be okay with the other? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's, here's the big question that, that uh, 
So I was sensing said Aikido was a tool to reconcile the world. That's my touchstone. That's what, what fires me. Mm -hmm. How does this practice on the mat save the world? Well, I think we're, I think I'm, I'm getting at that, you know, I mean, there, there's willing, in the first place, there's willingness to get together with someone who seems different or may seem um, in opposition to you. Um, you start being concerned to find the commonality, find the place where, uh, as we say in Aikido, we can make a blend and we can find out we're not so different or we can appreciate each other's point of view and then connect and move around and you know see some other creative possibilities. So much is born from that. Um, okay. you know, if you look at the... So let's be specific then. So what is it about Aikido training that makes that possible? And how does it translate to off the mat? Okay, well, so we'll start with the bow. Okay. And imagine uh, you're in the Middle East or you're in, uh, you can be anywhere, you can be in the, you know, an inner city, or it doesn't matter, but, you know, um, or it, gay and straight, you know, you bow. So here you have a Palestinian and Israeli, an Arab and a Jew, bowing to each other in mutual respect and, and appreciation, okay? That's the beginning, is that bow, I would say, in that sort of mutual respect, and then coming to engage. And even, I mean, in Aikido, uh, martial arts, we come to engage in a conflict, right? Coming to hit you and hurt you. So that's kind of what we, um, we experience. And then this is very important, so I'm glad you asked it. In that moment, and what's so interesting about martial arts is that it's really a study of our stress responses, okay? And we're stressing all day long <laughs> um, and, and af afraid of others and, you know, and et cetera. So here we have a strike or a grab or a choke or a kick, doesn't matter what it is, and there you are facing that that immediately elicits fight, flight, freeze. And so we then work with that and we become aware of, oh, you know, I'm afraid or, oh, I'm freezing or, oh, I'm, I'm fighting um, and, oh, I wanna win and dominate. And it's coming because I'm, I, I've been, my biochemistry has gone into and my neurophysiology, my brain functions down here in limbic lizard brain like that because I'm about to, I'm facing an attack um, or a stressor just pressure, a stressor. And so then we work with that. And that's where all of our practices, and we are going to do some practice today um, of, you know, centering and grounding and balance and breathing and uh, being able to uh, not be reactive, so stress reactive, and to, um, you know, be able then to think clearly, to kind of um, maintain or restore our emotional intelligence so we're not in our lower emotions fear and anger and all that stuff, domination. We can be in the higher frequency emotions of you know, tranquility, serenity, harmony, unity, love, peace, oneness, all that stuff. And, uh, and from there, thinking more clearly, higher emotional intelligence, the ability to physically not be you know, shaking and heart pounding and sweating and can't perform, all of that. So that's what we're practicing on the mat. Uh, we're basically really dealing with stress in the most physical, visceral, somatic way involved with all of our faculties. And then once we can, uh, and then we need to be aware that in Aikido and on the mat, we're practicing that state of being that then we can take into every, every relationship, every interaction, every conflict, every difficulty, every, you know, all of that. Okay, so, so two supplementaries then. One, there are, it seems to me that there are many people who practice Aikido for a long time, and yet they never make the leap between what they're doing on the mat and what they do off it. What's mm -hmm. gone wrong there? It's part two is most of the world are not going to come onto the mat to get that really powerful training that Aikido provides. So how do we take the message of Aikido out to those people so they can benefit too? Well, I mean, those are kind of generalizations. I think, um, like I've had the experience, uh, I've had students who, uh, you know, were in the dojo for a week, a month, a couple months, or a year, you know, not a long time, completely impacted their life. In fact, I just got an email uh, about a month ago from a woman, and she wrote me, she said, you know, I was at your class 30 years ago, 
and she's the CEO of a consulting company. She just asked me to come on board and work with them and do some consulting since I am doing, you know, taking this to the business world. But out of the blue, 30 years ago, she wrote me this whole story of how that one session I did impacted her. Oh. And she did karate. She was at a, you know, a, a martial arts seminar that I, I brought Aikido in. She said, oh my God, that just completely turned my head around. And I talk about that all the time for 30 years. And I wanted you to know about the impact. So oh. I get... You know, I well, get she had you as a teacher. She had you as a teacher to make that link for her. You know, many other places where that, that, that's just not talked about. Well, that's why I think it's important. And I want to be a voice to urge people, all of us here and, you know, everyone who trains um, to really be aware of what we're doing in the dojo. And I think I wrote that in the thing, you know, what are we really up to in our training? And then how can we carry that in the world? So again, I've had experiences where I've had people who haven't trained too much or I've been doing a lot of Ike extending work uh, with people speaking and you know, golfers or business people, CEOs, people you don't think they're, what are they, they don't know anything about Ike, don't know why they care about it. And I bring it to them and they're just like, uh, and it's always somewhere between, they always say something like, oh my God, this is like, wow, this is brilliant. And then it's like, this is duh. It's like so obvious, like, well, why did anybody ever tell me this? And it is, it's both wow and duh, I think, because it, this is generic, this is universal, this is kind of the way it is. We haven't even talked about key yet. Um, and so it's really enlightening, it really makes a difference um, for people. Who, sometimes I think some of us who do Aikido all the time, we almost lose that, that wow factor, or we almost lose, you know, we get so busy doing all of our Nikyos and Sankyos and Kodagaishas that we, uh, we almost lose a little bit of the impact that probably first got all of us into Aikido in the first place and realizing uh, what, what we really are up to through Aikido and what I think O-sensei wanted us to be up to. Um, can I talk about key a little bit? I think it's time to come to key, yeah. <laughs> time, time, okay, so I always say keep your eye on eye, right? Um, and then the key is the key. So key, I mean, this big oneness is key, life energy we don't have words for it in, in English, which I think is kind of telling, but the concepts of ki and chi and kundalini and prana, and ruach, we say in Hebrew, that uh, other cultures actually kind of try to talk about this. They, they, even though it's intangible, it's invisible, they see it, they validate it, and we can feel it. And it's really important that we feel it and that we know that that's the stuff that's, that's the same in all of us. That's the stuff that forms and reforms that's the stuff that, that you know, takes these diverse forms. So um, I, mean, I made a few notes here. Um, so key is, is extremely important. In fact, I always ask golfers, <clears throat> what makes your golf ball go? And they're like, oh, this, I, I just wanted to mention, I give some examples of how I try to walk people into Aikido who may not be Aikido people. Uh, so what makes your golf ball go? And they're like, uh, I hit it. <laughs> or then they start with, well, there's a swing and there's momentum and there's the club on the ball and there's impact and the speed, it, whatever. Then they get to energy. I'm like, okay, we're getting there. And what energy? Well, the energy from the club to the ball, the momentum of the swing. Yeah, that begs the question, where did that energy come from? And so then I give them the answer. I go, okay, I'm gonna give you my Stanford 580 Campa answer to what makes your golf ball go, ready? <laughs> you, you make your golf ball go. Right. And what does that mean? And then the next question is, well, who are you? And they're like, whoa. So in five minutes, we're kind of deep in, right? <laughs> who are you? And I go, okay, I'm going to give you an answer. Just so this is a practical answer. I am life energy in a body, right? So I have this body, right? I, I hold the club. It's my energy that has to get connected to the club or the sword or the, your hand, your kick, whatever it is. My energy. And I have to learn how to connect it to this thing I'm using and wind it up, deliver it. Well, it turns out in golf, we're standing here at zero miles an hour from here back to impact. That takes about one second on a clock. In one second, that club head can generate, I, you, can generate 80, 100, even now all these uh, great young guns are, you know, generating 120, 160 miles of club head speed in one second out of their body. And that's when you use your body correctly. That's what we learn in Aikido, order of movement, lower to upper body, connection, relaxation, tension tends to choke off the flow of and slow down that, that uh, flow and transfer of energy. So when you understand, oh, it's my energy 
makes the golf ball go. My energy makes everything happen, your energy. Well, then we start getting interested in this energy that we are. Okay, so then you go on oh, life, energy, and body, and they're like, okay, yeah. Well, I usually ask, I like, I'll have two CEOs or two golfers, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> I'll ask them to lay down and side by side, right? No holding hands, no hugging and kissing. And uh, just, and one of one person is gonna be asleep, the other's gonna play dead. Do you mind playing dead? Okay, you know, we've all played dead. So go ahead, everybody, play dead. Just right now, just play dead. What do you do when you play dead? We've all done it, all right? Yeah. So we, we're like, we stop breathing, right? And we tighten up and we don't move. We're like, oh, don't see me. Yeah. Or else you just go, oh, you're gone. So one person's asleep, one person's dead. We walk in the room and we probably notice something's kind of weird. We would feel it, right? We would feel something's different. And so um, then you get interested in that. Well, the person who died, died 15 minutes ago. They're still warm, got the color, got their clothes on. How would you know the difference between the sleeping body and the dead body? And basically one's breathing, the other isn't, okay? That's the big thing. And then we get aware, now I can start talking to them about breath. Oh, first thing, you know, if you have a kid, but you want, to, want an inhale, want the lungs to move. And what's the last thing at the end? The last breath. So now life's one big breath. If we're lucky, we get more or less in between. The quality, I read this when I was 16 years old, Alexander Lowen, that book's still around, Language of the Body. It's one of the forerunners of somatic psychology for fathers, founders, whatever. Um, and he said, breath is life. Therefore, the quality of your breathing is directly related to the quality of your living. You're doing, you're performing, you're experiencing everything. As a psychologist, you start to become very aware that we stop breathing or we breathe in a shallow way to stop our feelings, it's too much, yeah? And stress breathing <laughs> is up here, uh, hyperventilating, this kind of thing, and we calm by belly breathing. So breathing's a really big deal. Now, I mean, in, in a couple minutes, I can start talking to, uh, with business people or athletes or whatever, who uh, about breathing, you know, you know, all these yoga things, and this is why, right? And we even see her on, on television, hey man, take a break take a breath, yeah, to a football player or whatever. So um, anyway, so this is getting to that. And then I say, okay, well, there's one other thing that's different. The guy or the gal who's sleeping is going to wake up and they're going to walk and talk and they're going to make love and make money and all that stuff. How come? And the other one isn't. Your answer can't be because they're dead or because they're not breathing. So why else? What else? You know, <laughs> and then we go, well, and we think about it, and I usually ask people, have you ever been there when someone passes or someone dies? And quite a few people have. And so there's usually responses like, well, something leaves or something's not there or something went away or there's an absence of something. Well, of what? And we call it soul or spirit is the best we do usually in, in the West. But um, <clears throat> that's really, can we agree? We could just call that this life energy, yeah this life energy, it's not there anymore. It's, at least it's not in the body. We don't know where it went. You can have your beliefs about it. On a functional, practical level, it's this thing that animates our bodies. And they call it actually in Hebrew, nishama is soul, but that comes from the uh, nishima, which means to breathe. So the breath, and we know our breath carries our life force when the breath is in the body, when it's not. So, oh, well, maybe it would behoove us to be good stewards or become more masterful in how we use our energy. In our energy, this is universal across cultures, ages, uh, sexes, genders, doesn't matter. It comes in uh, four main faculties by which we experience and express this life energy that's in this body. And they're called mind, body, emotion, spirit, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. Those are our faculties. And so we want those faculties to be as alive and awake and you know, online as possible. And they also need, this is where I comes in, they, they need to work in harmony. So, you know, if you have your mind saying one thing, I can do this, and your emotions are going like, I really can't, and your body's having stress reactions, like, you need to be in harmony, in alignment, right? And so, and who's in charge of that? So this is another key thing that we can learn, or that we learn in Aikido, and that we can also translate. Who's in charge of your life energy? I have a whole bunch of CEOs going, one, two, three, all together now, right? I'm in charge of my life energy, right? 
and stress is a response. I can respond differently. And so you know, these are new things and they're like, oh, and you know what? When you become like kind of an energy master, you're a good steward of this energy that you're very lucky to have. We also can talk about gratitude. No matter what's going on, let's just be happy. This life energy is still in this body. Those faculties are still working because when it's gone, boy, it's gone, that's it. So um, now people are interested in energy and they get, well, this is a, this is a level most people aren't thinking about working at and then you're gonna get some new capabilities or, or you're gonna access so much more that's in, in you and uh, you have a competitive advantage or, and, and we can see, I mean, you know, what's managing the mental game, the mind emotional game, right? Working at those dimensions, it turns out, you know, people do better, businesses do better. Um, empathy is part of love and, um, <clears throat> and connection, caring, recognizing this oneness in each other, that equal bow. And so we can talk about empathy. And uh, since COVID, empathy is like a big buzzword in business circles. Leaders need empathy. That's a, a bigger value now than ever. Uh, <clears throat> the, the fact that people you know, need to be, be working together, need to be caring and connected. So you know, these, are all, these are all really important things, I think. Um, the other, the Aiki part, um, let's talk about that for a minute. So Aiki is when, you know, the energies are working together, right? Things are all in a harmony and, um, you know, we need more social harmony. We need more collaboration. This is peace and peace in Hebrew is the word shalom. Most people know that word. Shalom means, uh, comes from the root word that means shalem, uh, the root letters of shalem, which means wholeness. So wholeness and peace, wholeness is what peace is, is when we have a wholeness. And wholeness is those uniting of what seem like opposites and dualities and oppositions. You know, um, heaven and earth. Every culture has been aware of heaven and earth and above and below, Hermes talked about as above, so below, ancient Greeks. Uh, we have Ten Shinage, right? We have Osensei talking about heaven and earth and the floating bridge of heaven. We have, uh, um, in Hebrew, you know, Bereshit, in the beginning, there was heaven and earth. God created the heaven and the earth. That's the very first sentence of the whole Old Testament. And so, actually, this would be a good place maybe where we could do a little practice. Perfect. Um, yeah, let's see. Does anybody have any questions or comments so far? And then I do want to do so a practice. Folks, if you, this is the point where if you want to ask a question, you're going to need to unmute yourself. So just stick your hand up, I'll shout your name, and, and then you can go. I can't see two screens, so I'm going to have to flick between the two because there are too many of you here tonight. Well done. Um, Jamie Sensei? Yes. Uh, what was the book you mentioned, the somatic book again, and the author? That sounded just like uh, something that we should all know. Yeah. Language of the Body. Thank you. Dr. Alexander Lowen, L O W E N. It's from the 60s, yeah. I think. Great yeah. book. Still a great book. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, so much that we say uh, new age. Uh, thank you, Susan. Yes, uh, new age. Uh, nothing's new. <laughs> you know, there's really, uh, as we say, en chadash, chadash, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, we're just kind of repackaging it and it, we're still trying to understand it, right? Nobody got it <laughs> up until now. Maybe we can start getting it a little bit, bit more now. Anybody else? Because I do want to do a practice. When we do the practice, do you want people unmuted or you want them to stay muted? Um, you know, they can unmute. Um, be, uh, a little feedback you can go uh-huh or you can just nod or you can go like this or if you you know i may say ask if you feel that a little bit so let me just say what the practice is going to be okay <clears throat> and these aren't things you haven't heard of and i can kind of dive right into it without too much background because most of us do aikido so what i um i had an opportunity about God, a dozen years ago now uh well i had a sort of a, a message during a meditation that I needed to get these principles that I was teaching in Aikido and peace work and golf out to people of power and influence. That was how it came to me. I thought, well, who's that? And well, my brother was in the uh, Senate and, and, and uh, elected political life. I thought, okay, elected officials. And then the other were, oh, business people and business leaders. So I was like, what? I'm going to be like a, a business, a corporate speaker. Uh, and uh, some cool things happen and boom, I got to be a corporate speaker all over the place with an organization that has CEO groups everywhere. And I, so I've been all over the place doing it. You may notice I've been traveling all over and that's usually from there. Well, um, and then I was like, well, I had to create a program. And 
what I did in creating that program that got snapped up right away, stress less, prosper more, effortless power for unprecedented success, peaceful power leadership, productive conflict uh, resolution, letting go for your goals. You can hear kind of the Aikido in all of these uh, programs that I teach. Well, what I did was I synthesized Aikido, somatics, psychology, peace work, uh, peak performance into a uh, seven step, right? They liked the seven steps too. So I did that and, uh, I, and synthesizing that, I call it a uh, seven step body, mind, self mastery technology. How's that? <laughs> so I'm going to uh, share that with you all. We're gonna do it. This usually takes a lot longer to teach people, but uh, you guys are familiar with every part of it, but I hope you'll enjoy going through that. Ready? So let's everybody stand up if you like. Uh, I will be here. Let's see my cool new um, shirt with my cats on it. I love it. Okay, so seven step body mind mastery technology. We begin with centering. No surprise to us, right? So here we are, and uh, I'll take you through a couple centerings. So I'd like you to just uh, stand and with a vertical posture so that you can feel your, I got this here, you can feel the uh, center line of your spine, you can feel the center line in, in your body, and then imagine there's this parallel line in the middle of your body, those three parallel lines, they're absolutely in line with gravity. And gravity takes us down, and it's the most natural thing, so that we don't have to use our muscles to stress or to, uh, to force, okay? So as you stand, in this vertical posture, be aware of your, your head. Yeah, we call it your crown chakra up here at the top of your head. And it comes right down through the center line, the center column. So we're gonna consider our torso, we're gonna put some new words on our torso, the center column of our body. And notice that you have your uh, mind, your brain, your cognitive, rational, conscious mind there. And then you go straight down, you come to your throat. You can even use your hand and touch. Feel your throat, that's your communication, that's your um, that nourishment. Yeah, that's how we take food in and things. So this is really important, this area. Bring your hands down to your lungs, your heart, that's your love, your empathy, and then down to your diaphragm, down to your tantin, your hara, your um, power center, goes down through your vitals, and then through your legs into the earth. So be aware of yourself as this connection, your body connects heaven and earth. Now, as you close your two eyes, become aware of your third eye. And notice your third eye is on that center line column. And your third eye is this openness to the full, full intelligence of the universe. We have a rational mind, but we have intuition. We have some spiritual knowing, energetic knowing. It, it's an opening to so much more. And feel that your third eye, this connection to all the intelligence and universe is on that center line and that you connect heaven and earth, the energies above and below. You can even uh, put your arms up and spread your legs and be aware of how your arms are not just arms, we'll call them pipelines of energy through your fingers and your arms. You can bring energy in and it comes down, the apex is in your tantian, your belly. By the way, I usually have my black belt on, people can see the center. And feel the earth, this molten energy, this incredible power and, and strength of the earth and, and fire. Bring it up through your legs. So your legs aren't just legs, they're actually pipelines of energy. And the apex of that, boom, right here. So the Japanese call this kikai, an ocean of energy. You have your own reservoir of this life energy. Um, it's not, you know, it's out there, but it's the same inside and we can take it in and feel that you can, from your center, you can extend it out. So if we're doing Aikido technique, it's coming, when we say use your center, oh, it's an energetic flow. And it comes up, it starts in the legs. So we can send energy. And you can send at any point, any part of your body. Yeah? So you're an alive, energetic being. How cool is that? And then as you breathe, and we don't have time to go into tons of breathing, but breathing is that interchange uh, with the, the energy around us, okay? Then uh, clap your hands quickly and go like this. This is a very clear center line. This is like our sword line. And if you move your hands off that center, then feel the same. Come back to center, boom. And when you get to center, we usually exhale, relax, go down, 
Yeah, it's a very comfortable place. Go off center, a little strain, a little off balance. Don't breathe so deeply, doesn't feel right. And then come back to the center line. Natural exhale, natural going down, natural, uh, natural letting go. Natural organization, it's like our brain, our neurophysiology, our two hemispheres of our brain connect. Okay, so this now we're very practical about heaven and earth above and below that you are that that we are an energy flow and through all the cells and tissues and organs and muscles and limbs of our body. Okay, so that's a very quick centering but I could say so much more but centering is integrating as well. Let me say one more quick thing while we're on centering this is super important and I share this with golfers that golfers who were always trying to make centered contact so I actually brought a golf club. Center contact, it's right here. It's what we call the sweet spot, sweet spot. If we miss here, here, the ball's going offline. So the energy reverbs back, it hurts our hands. Sweet spot is it's very, it feels good. Yeah, and the ball goes the best. So we're always looking for the sweet spot in a deal, in a conversation, in a relationship. Here's a theory. If I'm centered and I move in a centered sequential way, the club's gonna come down and make centered contact. So when we're centered, we tend to calm our minds and integrate and we make this, uh, it's like sweet spot living, more centered living. Otherwise, like golfers, it's random, you know, who knows what's going to come out, but boom, all of a sudden. So this is key eye golf or Aiki golf, centered plus centered all equals centered. All right, so let's, uh, if you're set down, let's uh, maybe come back. So step one in the seven steps is center. And I always say center thyself, not center yourself. There's something really kind of sacred, divine, cool about this energy. All right, notice that when you get centered and we can get kind of that heavy bowling ball feeling or weight underside, we call it, um, from Koichi Toei Sensei, we get that heavy and that grounded, that, that gravity, that when we get centered, we automatically get grounded. But we wanna be conscious of it. Feel how you connect your legs and feet. All of a sudden you're more balanced. Maybe both your feet feel balanced on the floor. You feel your muscles engage. Instantly, you're stronger. You didn't need uh, you know, Popeye and spinach. You didn't need to go to the gym for six months or a year. You're strong and you're present. Notice how you become very present in your body. You can feel your legs and feet. You can feel the whole connection. And, and then and you're breathing more. So all that happened in step one and two, center and ground. All right, number three, breathe. Breathe and relax. It all kind of goes together. So we could go through a lot of breathing exercises, but also notice that breathing comes pretty naturally when you get centered and grounded and you relax naturally, your shoulders, tension, uh, worries, thoughts, I'll put them all in your center, ground them. Wow, all of a sudden you're more clear and you're a more clear conduit of energy just from step one and two and three, right? Breathe and relax. Step four is going to be aligned, unify and align, unify and align. So unify, this bringing the left and right together, like in just a clap, the most natural thing in the world. Lower and upper body, unite, yes? And, they, and um, <clears throat> lower and upper, inner and outer body. Now I can talk about this, this obviously takes more training, but you guys get it, inner and outer body. Thought, visualization, intention, mind and physical execution, doing whatever we're doing, okay? So those integrate, they unify and they need to align. Right, so we have this sword, this clear sword, or alignment in golf, or in a conversation, or to whatever it is that it is we're doing, yeah, uh, to, with our partner. And, uh, you know, uh, just about that one is uke and nage, we talked about in Aikido, and I say, well, you know, you'll learn the same on both sides of the technique, because it's all one, yeah? All right, so now we're already did step one, two, three, and four. Center, ground, breathe and relax, unify and align. Step five is blend. Now, most people haven't heard of blend. We have because of Aikido. Blend is that joining, that connecting, that willingness to unite, to find the way to come together, all right? Not resist, not stay in opposition. Blend, and that's both a mental and a physical thing. How can we blend? How can we go with, go with the flow, right? Most people have heard of that. So blend, we give them a new word. We practice some movements that blend. All right, so that's non-resistance. And then number six is let go, <sighs> let go, right? All of our force, all of our efforting, our ego, our attachment, the outcome, it's gotta be the way I wanted it, control, let go. And letting go isn't just like to nothing. 
letting go, we are, because we're in this whole connected state, we are letting go to bigger energies, bigger power, bigger intelligence. We study the nature of energy and we find out that it's what I call omni, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. You know, I learned that when I was five years old in religious school, yeah? But that's, you know, they called it God, but this is this energy, the nature of the energy. So we let go. And then number six, we flow. Now we're in a state of flow. So if we were stressed, if we were tight, if we were forcing, if we were fearful, if we were separate, oh, we've just unified, connected, aligned, and we find ourselves in flow with all of this natural energy and power, okay? So that's your seven steps, kind of synthesizing all this together. We could go into every one of them. They're, they're so rich and practice them, but I think you can all kind of understand that body, mind, mastery technology. And, and then we learn to quickly be able to shift so go, let's go and ahead and sit down. Um, I wanted to talk about shifting. Shift. Do you want to just check um, it or ask if there are any questions, Jamie? Yeah, okay, any questions? Questions or comments on that, folks? Just unmute your mic and speak because it's just hard to go over two screens and see what people are doing. Hi, Jamie, Linda Eskin here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Could you just repeat the... Um, Names of the, the seven, steps yeah. quickly. One, I missed center. a couple. Center, yep. center thyself, center yourself. Number two, ground, grounded. Number three, breathe and relax. Number four, unify and align. Number five is blend, non resistance. Number six is let go. And let go is allowing yourself to be this, this, this bigger being that you are, you know? Um, and also of outcomes and force and all that control. Let go and number seven, and that's a whole huge story, releasing. I teach a lot of stuff about releasing, but that's an important one. Uh, and number seven is flow. <sighs> Thank you so flow. much. Yeah. Jamie, I was curious what the physical uh, exercises you use to teach this let go and release principle. <laughs> yeah um well uh it, we can do a real quickie i mean i have a whole course about um you know releasing there's a, a ton of stuff about releasing but uh you could hold a pen or anything you can drop safely right and it's like uh <clears throat> so here i am i'm holding this yeah and release well let it go well okay yeah you should tell me ask people to try to let it go so go ahead and try to let it go joanna you did not follow instructions, you let it go. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we find out that, uh, you know, try to let it go. I'm trying, I'm trying. And this is something we all do. We're trying all the time. I'm trying, I'm trying. When we're trying, Fritz Perls, the founder of Gestalt Therapy said that trying's lying. So while I'm trying, I still got it, yeah? <laughs> and you need to know that. So all the time, every time you say, I'm trying, I'm trying, you need to know what you're doing, right? You're still using your energy to, with this thing, you're still involved in it. Okay, go ahead and let it go, yeah? And then we look at, I mean, what does it feel like to let go? How'd you let go? You decide, you something, but there's always an opening, there's a breath. And then it's like, well, do I feel empty? Like, ah, I don't have my pen anymore. Am I empty if I let go or am I open to possibilities? Or what if I don't let go? I got my pen and now I gotta have some water and now I wanna have something. You know, it's like, it, this is all the stuff piles up, it's in our way. Let go allows possibility and it, it, it uh, frees our energy. There's a lot of ways we hold. We hold on and in and against and up and forth. And, you know, we hold so many ways. I don't know another verb that has so many uh, propositions after it. Yeah. Because and, and then we start to feel how we hold in our bodies. And when we go through those other steps, we find that oh, that holding has gone away. You know, it's going more and more away. And then we want to be aware of letting go. And, um, and opposition. So there's a lot, a lot of things we, you know, in Aikido. Oh. Um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, some of you may have heard of Kabbalah, the Kabbalah, uh, the Jewish book of mysticism. A lot of people are working with it. But a, a concept is tikkun olam. Anybody heard of tikkun olam? You may have. So yeah. So tikkun olam in Hebrew, it means to, to fix. So it's called repair of the world. And this is one of those paradoxes, like another one of those koans. If the world is whole and complete and I'm perfect, whole and complete and the being that I am and I'm totally lovable and wonderful and awesome, 
but wait, I feel so broken and not adequate and I'm always working to improve myself and I got to grow and develop. Well, how do those two go together? How can we have this perfect world and yet it's broken and we need to fix it? So, you know, we're always working with paradoxes. It's like uh, teaching golf or Aikido, you know, you got to learn and think about what you're doing and yet you just want to do it. Just go, feel the flow, feel the energy. Well, but wait, I, I need to know where to put my right foot and my left foot and when and how. And so we go back and forth between thinking about it and mechanics and technique to letting go and letting it happen. The master said the purpose of kata, a form, which we need our rational mind to think about and learn, the purpose of kata is to throw away the kata. But you can't just go, oh, I'll just swing. Oh, I'll just throw them. It doesn't work. We got to... You know, you need the kata to throw away the kata, but then it becomes part of us. So this body-mind technology is like a kata. And the more people practice it, the more a leader practices it, right? You find yourself communicating differently, thinking more clearly, managing your emotions in a much more um, intelligent way. Now, your body is healthier you're, and you're not tight and stressing and all this stuff. And oh, energy's flowing through. I, most of you know I had a bad bicycle accident and it's not even four months yet uh, where I broke my jaws and my chin and I couldn't talk. And I mean, it's been agony. <laughs> a friend said it was medieval torture. I'm like, that's what it is. Yeah, this was medieval torture. So in under, you know, three, four months, I'm in pretty good shape. Still got stuff going on, but I've been doing pretty well. I've used all of these eye and key and energy practices and managing my mind, emotion, all of this stuff. And whew, when I was in the worst anxiety and the worst fear and the worst pain, oh, center, breathe, ground. I mean, I literally, and, and when we say literally, we say somatically. So it's so important. I mean, these ideas, like I said in the beginning, these ideas, these concepts, they're not abstract and they're not all spiritual woo woo. They're so practical in our bodies. And energy, which seems intangible, is practical, it's tangible. Uh, so this is where we have Aikido and you know, whatever, it doesn't matter what your spiritual philosophy or your great ideas and, and things are, where they connect and meet and join with the physical body and the somatics. And this is who we are. And then our actual doing, we talk about performance, peak performance. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite quotes, and I, I share it all the time, from Albert Einstein, who we think of as a brainiac. And I mean, he was one of those greatest minds that ever lived. But Albert said, learning is experience. All the rest is just information. So if his brainiac is saying learning is experience, it's in our bodies. And that takes me to Do, okay? Aikido, we talk about I and Ki. Thank you, Quinn's going, yeah. I wanted to get to Do. <laughs> so it, we just got there. <clears throat> Albert takes us to do of all things, not to thinking. He takes us to do. So I, <clears throat> do looks a lot like do in English. I key do. And so now we can start talking to all these sort of regular folks <laughs> about doing. What does doing mean? What we will call practice. Practice is regular doing you can't just think about these things or know about them all the rest you know it's just information you got to do it's experience and it's somatic it's in our it's in our, our living so and what does do mean do means to do it's regular like go back to first grade you had to to learn to write the alphabet a a b b c c remember how many you wrote <laughs> and you practiced them so carefully and b and f and all of that well and you made a million of them right and then tell you that's the kata of the alphabet, each letter, do them enough. As you're doing them, this is really interesting. And I got this from uh, neuroscience uh, lectures and friends. So this is from the neuroscientists, <clears throat> dumbed down, but <laughs> here it goes, is that each time we do, we make a, a somatic neuromuscular action, we are developing the neurology for it. We, and, and your brain cells, and I actually saw videos from neuroscientists, uh, fast forward you know, videos, uh, fast videos, uh, where the brain cells, every time you do something, A, A, B, B, Ikyo, Ikyo, Sankyo, Sankyo, yeah? Every time you do that action, your brain cells grow or are growing little dendrites. And then, and we saw dendrites growing while the person's doing, yeah? And so the dendrites grow and then they find each other. They're long enough, they find each other. That's what we call a neuromuscular pathway. 
And so those pathways get built in the course of doing. If we just sit here, they're not getting built, all right? Um, I mean, it helps to think about them a little bit, but you gotta do them uh, with your, your muscles. So here we are, and now we have our dendrites, and now we've created neuromuscular pathways. Well, they start out as like a little trampled down grass. And then the more you go over them, it turns into a path. And then you go, oh, this is a great path. Let's make it, a, let's pave it. Let's make it a bike path. Oh, it's really great. Let's turn it into a road. And this is how you start to build, um, you know, uh, new, easier motions. You can throw away the kata that can compete in a sense with the, the super highways of all, all our habits. And this is why it takes 30 days, say, to start building a new habit you got to repeat repeat to grow the dendrites to make the neuromuscular pathways to build those things and it gets easier easier and now that's going to start coming out it's also why our default is usually the things that we've always done and that's why we need to continue to practice so when you start understanding things that way um kind of makes sense yeah uh, and so doing becomes very very important <clears throat> And it's a nice way to engage people in practice, what we call, you know, my, my yoga practice and my meditation practice. You don't want to hear about that so much, but practice, yeah. Or that it transforms, like say for golfers, golfers practice, but what do they do? You know, they're, and they're making muscle memory. I'm always like, well, what are you remembering? All this crap you're doing. Let's learn some right stuff. The martial arts masters put all the exact little details and positions and transitions and qualities of movement into a kata then you could teach it and you could learn it and people can go home and practice it, yeah? Um, so through this sort of kata and doing the right stuff and doing and repeating and practicing, it starts to come into the neuromuscular system, yeah? And then it starts to become more natural. It's like learning to drive a stick shift. Those are great examples of doing and also of I and key. <laughs> So, I mean, if you, I remember I almost broke my brother's car learning to drive a stick shift, it was terrible. Or if you taught your kid or something, it's like, <laughs> that's the lack of eye. That's the gears are grinding. We don't roll along well. You can even hurt the components of the car, right? And it's, but it's so hard. Do this, do that, my foot, my hand, this, where does that go? But you do it enough and pretty soon you do it until whoever thinks about it, you're just driving your stick shift. Perfect example. And also of having eye. You know, I and love and harmony, uh, football teams need it, right? <laughs> this isn't some woo-woo, nicey, nice thing. Uh, I mean, you see a football, you know, everyone, all the players on the line, whatever, and they're doing their jobs and they're all in harmony and the guy runs down the field, throw the ball, you know, she catches it. It's like, beautiful, score. That's when we score. That's when we're successful. Otherwise, we have a broken play. Things fall apart. And so again, how do we see these things in, in regular real life? How do we engage people uh, with these principles of Aikido? I really consider them generic universal principles and that's really what those Sensei gave us. Um, I mean, that's why I say 45 years, I'm still doing Aiki and Do because there's so much in them. And as we practice them and see them and apply them and, and all, it, it just transforms it transforms our health, our happiness, our performance, our well-being, our relationships. It transforms absolutely everything. And, and, and we have this, this Aiki, this harmony. Uh, we can extrapolate that to nation states, to policy. I mean, we just need it so badly. Our world is so divided. Our country's in tatters right now, whoever thought. And it's because of division. And division has hatred in it and not appreciating the oneness and not appreciating the power of collaboration and ease that uh, uh, golf's a good example. You know, you force it, uh, golfers are always trying to kill the ball, not the Aiki way, right? And that, oh. They're famous, they're notorious for killing the ball using all this muscle force and upper body. They don't know about their lower body and their center and unification, the seven steps we went through. They start learning that and in a really, you know, detailed somatic way. It's like, Sensei, give me the body parts. When does my foot move in this? Oh, we can connect our foot and our hands, you know, and our, our hips. So it all connects. Well, all of a sudden and breathing flow, it's like, wow, the ball's going farther. Yeah, uh, Lao Tzu said, do less, accomplish more. We need to experience that. That's not just some, wow, that's such a cool idea. No, we do less from the tension and, and divided in pieces place. We get unified, we move in harmony and connection and there's flow. It's like, wow, I'm accomplishing more. 
people are saying yes to me, right? <laughs> our team got creative, oh my goodness, our, our brainstorming, all people's different ideas. It's working together. It's that working together. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always say I'm, I'm results oriented. It's like, you know, I want to hit the ball farther. I want to score well. I want to make the money. I want things to happen. Yeah. Um, I want peace on earth, but not like peace on earth. No, I want things to function in a harmony that's really life-giving and supportive and creative for, for, for all. Um, so a question, yeah. Jamie. So uh, you, you talked about when you're doing your business consultancy, that very often you, the people say, duh, well, of course. Okay, <laughs> it's not like what you're saying doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense. So why is it so many people are struggling to adopt what is really common sense? I think that's a great question, Quentin. And I think that's up to all of us to figure out these things. And I try to give you some examples of ways I do it, you know, um, to make it practical or to get people interested. Um, you know, they lay down, one person's dead, one's asleep. Oh, they kind of start getting it. And I thought, oh, wow. And now they're interested in breathing. Um, oh, yeah. <gasps> Oh, oh, that's what you're talking about. So, you know, if we can make it practical, if we can also let them know that they're getting better results and here's how and why. Um, so I, I, I talk a lot about being a translator. I think I did this in Mark Walsh's Embodiment Conference. I talked about bringing somatics and Aiki to mainstream society. Um, we need to translate what we're doing in ways that people can get. So you give them ideas and ways they can see them and they also feel it. They can feel it. It's like, oh yeah, oh I get it, and uh, and then you let them know, oh, what if you could get better results? And <clears throat> you know, I kind of tell them all these tools. Pretend they're toys. Try them out. Be curious. See if they work. Have fun with them. And then they start engaging with their these toys, tool toys. And um, but I think that I think people just need a chance to hear about this and feel it and see it in ways they can understand, like. The center, the sun is the center of the solar system. A hub on a wheel equals spokes. You know, every system just needs that, that um, you know, has a center, right? And, or harmony and an orchestra and a football team and driving your car. Oh, that's what you're talking about. So I think that sometimes Aikido, we use this language that's a little fluffy yeah. or a little too abstract. Yep. And it sounds so great and we know what it means and we're already thinking about doing it on the mat. But people don't know what that we're talking about. They read it, Aikido is the harmony. They don't get it. So we have to explain it a little. It doesn't take that much. Okay. Give them a little example, real life, real life examples. And then they're like, ah, oh. like I can remember I had, I'll never forget. I had some like 75 year old little Jewish guy in Boca Raton, Florida, right? I'm giving him a golf lesson. And he said to me at the end, he goes, oh my God, now I really wish I was 20 again. I wish I could have gone through life knowing this. It would have made a big difference. And uh, I mean, I think we should be teaching this in first grade, quite honestly. When we teach reading, writing, arithmetic, mm. what if we taught, you know, you're, you're five, six years old. I have life energy in a body, you know, and it comes through on my mind. Oh, that's how I think. And that's, you know, all my thoughts and oh, my emotions. And yeah, and, and I'm in charge of my energy and it needs to work together. I'm going to throw my baseball better. I'm going to ride my bike better. Um, you know, and when I start fighting with my you know, brother or sister, we can like you know, stop and breathe for a second and whatever. You, know, you can adapt this to kids. But if, a, if you would have learned or I would have learned in first grade, reading around myth, but I learned I'm life, energy, and body. I got a body, mind, emotion, spirit, and I'm in charge of it. And I can do anything I want. And when I learn how to put it together with drawing a picture or whatever it is I want to do, playing my, you know, my oboe, or it doesn't matter, my guitar, or singing a song, then it matters. Yeah. And then people are outfitted from a young age with these concepts and in, in a real, you know, experiential feeling way. And we're outfitted with what we need in life. And we're also outfitted from the start with a, the right kind of mindset, consciousness. So yeah. this relates to a question that was asked on, online. Um, so, um, you know, people can be quite successful in life. They adopt patterns that work for them. They're, they're, they make money in business. Uh, but so getting people to change habits when what they're doing, they think is working for them. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily open to the possibility that there's another way that would be even more successful. Mm -hmm. How do we jumpstart them into being open-minded well, enough? Good question. 
So, I mean, you know, I remember just about everything I say and do. And when I learned a, a word in Hebrew or Russian, I remember just about everything. I do not remember when I sat down to write my uh, program, my first uh, uh, business program. I really don't remember it. I must have been channeled or something. I have no idea. It's one thing I don't remember. So I think it came from. So here's the title. And so pretend that you're in my group, right? Stress less, stress more. Okay. So I go, who here wants to stress less? Yeah, most people raise their hand. Yeah, I'd rather, yeah, I, I could use the stress less. Okay, who would like effortless power? Like it wasn't so hard, like you weren't working so hard. Anybody interested in that? Yeah, okay, yeah, effortless power. Um, how about unprecedented success? You could do better than ever, even better than, yeah, you'd be interested in that? Okay, yeah, so that's what we're doing today. Yeah, stress less, prosper more. Oh, oh, I forgot that, stress less, prosper more. Who wants to stress less? Who wants to prosper more? Anybody? Yeah, sign me up. I want to prosper more. I want to do better. I want to make more money, whatever it is. Stress less, prosper more, effortless power for unprecedented success. So again, I don't remember when I wrote that. It came out of the ether. It's not out of me. But it's like kind of some things like that that are kind of hook people in. Oh, yeah, I'd like it to be easier. Oh, yeah, I'd like to do better than ever. I'm doing fine. But what if I could do even better? Um, limitless, limitless. Yeah, what if you limited less and you could have limitless, right? Um, what would that look like for you? Um, unprecedented success. Wow, it's never even happened before. Uh, yeah, sign me up, right? So if we find ways to interest people that matter to them, words that connect with them, then they're interested. And uh, really, like I told you, I got, I got accepted as a speaker within like five days. And it turned out my first invitation was from the master, master chair of these groups. And I had no idea what a big deal he was in this organization. And he gave me my first opportunity. Uh, and he just liked my title. <laughs> he was like, how'd you get to be a corporate speaker? It was my title, okay? And uh, people did you give in, in, in this world uh, that we're in right. have really been into it. Right. right. So I, I, I'm gonna just point out that we're coming up to yeah. about quarter past eight. Uh, I, I knew you would make my job really easy tonight. I knew that I, I just needed really to set you off and off you would go, um, uh -huh. which you've done beautifully. Thank you. Um, so shall we just open it up to see if people have comments, questions, etc. And then um, if you uh, feel that there's loads of material that you wish to cover tonight that we haven't covered, we'll, we'll talk about setting up a second session. Does that sound like a plan? Demi, did you hear that? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, Does that sound like a plan? Wait, uh, oh, I was, I, look at, I was looking at the chat for a second. Uh, sorry, repeat that? I said, uh, we open up for questions, comments. Mm, yes, absolutely. Uh, finish the session shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but if you feel actually there was quite a lot of stuff that you wanted to cover tonight that we've not, mm -hmm. if it's okay with you, and it, we'll, we'll just arrange another date to do that. Yeah, that's absolutely fine with me. I'd be happy to, yeah. Um, giving you previews of my book. It's taken so long to write the book. Well, I got injured, but I mean, it's just like trying to say all this and in a coherent way for everybody. Um, but yeah, with any comment or question? All right. So, and I do have one slide I'll find to show with you. I had a bunch. While you're looking for slides, uh, people ask questions. So I can see if some yeah, go ahead. Have, a number of you have unmuted. So fire away, somebody. Yep. You. Whoever said that, speak up. Oh, hi, it's me, it's Liz. Hi, Liz. <laughs> just, just me tonight. Jamie, thank you very much. That was really interesting. And, you know, there'll be so many sort of leads to follow up from that. I'm, I think we need about another 20 sessions. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. But the one thing that struck me is, is, absolutely, is you, when you're talking to people who are so incredibly proficient in one area in their life, they are massively successful, aren't they? They may have studied some martial arts or a high level or some professional area of activity to a very high level and getting across to them that they might want to explore things in a different way. And I mm -hmm. suppose it would be helpful to talk to people about the power of beginner's mind. So mm -hmm. no matter how far you've gone down one particular track, you always retain the ability to listen and absorb new ideas, new information, and to start again. And how liberating it is. Like I remember the first time I, 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 started, I, I went into a yoga Train, you know, a yoga hall after having done Aikido for some years 
and being the beginner again is enormously liberating isn't it mm, absolutely you don't yeah. have to be the expert anymore and that is wonderful <laughs> yeah well, you know, I, I will share this. It's been interesting. Uh, for example, I, you know, I'm a golf pro. I, I kind of came in uh, to the teaching part of uh, being a golf professional about 20 some years ago. And I mean, there's a lot of great theories and stuff of golf and a, a million things, right? And I've worked with a lot of golf professionals. I've been teaching actually an online for, um, golf mastery school called Kia Golf Mastery School. And we've been doing it virtually even. And I've had people, pros, some former tour pros, people have been teaching for 30 years and they kind of get this, this, uh, I don't want to even call it a framework because that's a little limiting, but it's this, this kind of conception of things. Yeah. And they are completely transformed. They're like enlightened. It's really quite incredible. Um, I had a golf pro, a guy who was 66. I remember he said, uh, and he saw me uh, give a presentation on stage. It was like a 10 minute thing. And he said, give me 10 more minutes. Um, I, I, you know, I, and he, he had like a whole bunch of golf academies by his name. He said, I've been in golf since I was six. I'm 66. Give me, I'll give you 10 more minutes. Give me your stuff. So I showed him and explained, and it was basically this in golf. And the guy, this is American guy, right? And he literally took off his baseball golf cap at the end and he bowed <laughs> and he said, thank you. I never thought I'd hear or see anything new or different in golf. I've seen it presented and I've taught in every way, shape and form. You have actually given me new views. I see things differently. And it's duh in a way, right? It was so brilliant, but so obvious. And he's like, I can't believe I never saw this. It's like, he goes, and that was, that was incredible. And he literally took his cap off and bowed, you know? So it, the, what we do, and I, I share that with you to say what we do, what you are doing is so, what we do in Aikido is so rich and has so much that we can apply it to and, and, and share with people. They don't necessarily have to come to the dojo or come to the dojo for 20 years or get a belt or a, a shodan or something. We have so much that makes so much difference. And it's this Aiki way. And, you know, here we are, we're hopefully with the vaccine and things we're going to be coming out of COVID one of these months, days or months soonish. But we know that we're going through a really transformative period and that being more in harmony with nature, being closer to ourselves and our homes and our people, uh, you know, in our lives and our communities. And we've got to, you know, we can't go back to the way we were. Well, where are we going to? We can see the divisions, the imbalances, the, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, divided our worlds and our countries and our societies are. We know we've got to work together and we've got to save the, the climate and the environment for all of us. And uh, yeah, all of these things, it's like, we have so much as Aikido is to contribute to not only that conversation, but to doing, to actually making it so that it will make an impact on how we're going about doing everything, whether people do Aikido or not, but they are open and they're interested. They've heard a little something about Aikido. And you can give them a, you know, I and Kido, you know, make it practical and real. And they're like, wow. So we can contribute that. And I want to urge people to, to think about what you're doing in the dojo in ways that you appreciate the absolute power of it. You know, O Sensei, this is a, a story I had heard. O Sensei was asked, is your Aikido a religion? And he said, no, my Aikido is not a religion. It brings all religions to completion. Now, how cool is that? I mean, let's just try to understand that. But it's kind of like, it's this whole big generic universal spiritual mind body, you know, ideas into living thing. He wanted Aikido to be medicine for a sick world. He wanted to reconcile the world. He wanted peace on earth, you know, but like not as an idea. How do we do that? Aikido. So think about that, you know, <laughs> and ask yourself, what's the meaning of my Aikido training? What can I really be doing with it? And, and how can I contribute to the coming out of COVID, uh, coming out of the crises that we're in? Um, right now, how do we contribute uh, Aikido uh, so that Aikido would be more known, more common, the name itself, the martial arts itself, but the principles, these ideas, um, and put them into action. This is where I say something like, and if you do think of some good stuff, you can bring it to the Aiki Extensions Mighty Network and share it. <laughs> all benefit from that stuff. <laughs> um, okay, any, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Q. You got your hand up. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Jamie, right at the beginning, you talked about people helping you to teach. Yep. If you remember. 
So probably it's a whole other session for you to describe that, what, what happened to you at that point. But I've, my question is slightly different. I, I think we, we need a, we need to encourage a, a new generation of teachers. What are the three key points to, to help people teach, particularly a younger generation of Aikidoka? Mm, that's a really nice question. First of all, I think we have to make space for them. This isn't only for the Shihan and the, you know, six, seven, eighth dons kind of thing. That's the first thing. It's a mindset uh, that appreciates um, what everybody has to offer and the creativity. So for example, in solstice seminars, if anybody's come, you know, we've created in over the last I don't know, six, eight months, uh, we, uh, we have uh, veteran teachers or whatever the high rank, but we have all these younger teachers and people who, um, you know, maybe haven't had those opportunities and like all their classes blow us away. It's awesome. So it's first of all, appreciating that, making space, making space for them. Um, I think we have to do a little bit more uh, or a lot more teaching about teaching. And yeah. understand, you know, help people understand and younger teachers that um, <clears throat> people have different learning styles, right? Whether it's right brain, left brain or uh, visual kinesthetic um, auditory and understand different learning styles. And that it's important that teaching connects with students. And so what do, you know, think about yourself. What do I need? How do I learn best? Um, and also that connection and that caring that when the teacher makes the, um, that, that bow and that real connection with empathy, with connection, with a oneness with the student, that that's when you learn. And everybody's a little bit different, but when people feel cared about, now that this goes into a, like neural leadership and the, these needs that people have, basic needs. We all need status. We all need, uh, there's, there's some things about it, but we need uh, autonomy and we need relatedness. Okay, this is another whole topic, but um, what, are, what, what does a person need in order to be able to learn? And all people need a sense of connection and that they're important and that they're cared about. And, uh, and they also, you know, they get some recognition, right? This is part of status. And when those things happen, people's energy just opens up and flows. When people are scared, when they feel put down, when they feel hurt, uh, <clears throat> when they feel sad and bummed and defeated, their energy feels just there. And this is looking at energy, right? Energy goes like this, all of a sudden they're less engaged, they're less motivated. So what do we do so that people are motivated and understanding that? And how can, you know, I be as a teacher that helps that to happen. So, you know, there's education and teaching. And what happens too often in Aikido and martial arts in general, but certainly in Aikido, it's like, you know, you get to be good in Aikido, you love Aikido and you open a dojo and you know nothing about teaching, <laughs> you know, about communicating, <laughs> about running a business. I mean, we need to educate people. It's not just because I'm good at it, you know, or I'm, I'm a good golfer. I mean, we have tour pros who can't teach for shit. No, I mean, you know, pardon my language, but you know, we need to do some of that education with the opening of the field to uh, not just to the top notch people and the older people and really recognizing that unless we give that space and encourage people um, younger, there are also their energy field's gonna close down. They're gonna lose their motivation. There's no place for me. I don't get any opportunities. The minute they do, oh my gosh. We, I just got a, a, a Facebook message from a young woman. Only oh, been doing Aikido for eight years. That's Siri, she's in um, uh, Mexico. She did one of the greatest seminars uh, or sessions at our winter solstice. Eight years in Aikido. She did one of the coolest classes ever. Um, and it's inspired so many of us. And I think she was in her 20s, maybe 30s, I don't know how old she is. And uh, she just wrote me, she said, you know what, looking back on 2020, the highlight was um, Solstice Seminars. Lovely. Because she had that opportunity. Is she the one who did the icky on the chair? Yes, yes, uh-huh. See, Absolutely you remember brilliant. her. She that that should be, no, that should be broadcast globally. Wasn't that brilliant? Yeah. But so, the yeah, chair, but... the chair should be made of Shehan, actually. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but, you know, she shared that in what you're going to have someone teach who's only been training for eight years, um, yeah. maybe a showdown at no, best. No. Yes, and look at what she did. She blew us all away. Yeah, exactly. So, Amy, say I have to go, but I just want to tell you, you are brilliant, and this was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being here, Kayla. Thank yeah. you. Good to see you here. Really yeah. lovely. So, um, Sente, yeah. Quentin, uh, I want to say thank you. It's a, a, an honor to be amongst so much wisdom in the room. Some of the very slight body moves I see people make when Jamie Sensei speaks, speaks volumes of the wisdom the others have. 
and they do not speak up, which speaks again volumes of the humility associated with masters of, uh, of wisdom. Um, for Jamie Sensei, I have, uh, onigashimasu. Uh, My name is Patrick. <laughs> nice to see you. I have a thought which could be for sure. the next session also. Because mm -hmm. the seven steps as you brought them, um, I was very, very curious about the flow, the rhythm and the cadence of how they, because sometimes you, as you were breathing, you breathe through three steps almost, right? And, I, and I, I'm <laughs> really curious about the flow of how they come together and how these steps build on each other and how that flow on the one hand, but the rhythm and the cadence as a practice to be inserted as a whole uh, into routines. Cause I'm a mm -hmm. business guy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always thinking routines. I don't think I'm also, uh, you know, I, they've done Aikido, so I know the kata, but for the business, it's a routine. And we've got millions of people in routines that are not good <laughs> for them. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we can't put them all on an offsite or put them on a mat, you know. So w if there were a way to insert a certain flow or cadence or a practice um, as simple as the bow, uh, I had 400 people from HP on the screen today. I could have told them, uh, why don't everybody get in little rooms of one-on-one -on -one and bow to each other for, for a minute and come <laughs> back and see how you feel, right? So yeah. uh, I thought that might be a, a nice uh, topic for also many of the others to contribute thoughts because many of us have been thinking of, of how to insert the learning into the business uh, space. And I, I, I'd be very, very curious, uh, Sensei, uh, Jamie, how you, how you feel about that. And, and it could probably be need, need more time uh, for next yeah. time. Thank you. You sowed the seed, Patrick. You sowed the seed, so thank you for that. Um, cool. I am going to, Jamie, obviously I'll let you close in a sec but we kind of at that time. Um, so I will quickly say, well, thank you for such great attendance tonight. Uh, thank you, Jamie, for, for a fantastic session. Um, you're gonna to have to think carefully about which topic you want to cover next time. Um, and just to say that I've got some really cool stuff coming up in the, in the next few weeks, that booked and stuff that we haven't, I haven't even booked yet, but I know it's gonna be really cool when we get there. One of them, Hugh, will be, what makes for a successful dojo, which will incorporate, you know, encouraging different teachings and, and giving space to people, I think. Next week, uh, we've got uh, Piers Cook, my brother, uh, will be talking about leadership and how Aikido can inspire good leadership. Um, I'll just leave it there for the moment and we'll, we'll explore that in a bit more detail next week. Um, Jamie, over to you to close us off. Um. I'm just going to close this up with also kind of an opening and Patrick just to kind of tie that in. Um, if, you know, if we want to do another session, uh, cadence, rhythm, uh, there's an order of movement and the body is an order of the way things are built and they're from kind of the ground up and lower to the upper body and how that works um, and through our anatomy. Um, and then we have, say, in a golf swing, we have time and tempo rhythm. We have uh, a flow, uh, you know, fluidity requires kind of following the right order in a certain way of things and how we can build that in, how our breath, you know, is connected to that. So, you know, we can do some, uh, some, some cool training, <laughs> uh, do a little bit more experiential with some of that. And, um, you know, and what is, we talk about flow state, that was, um, if, uh, you know, the, a slide I wanted to show you. And basically, um, in a certain way, I think what we do is a bumper sticker. And I'm going to tell you what it is. All right. And I got to swear one more time to it. <laughs> so uh, the bumper sticker says, uh, shit happens, shift needs to happen. Okay. So play in words. So, you know, shit, stress happen. They happen. It's just life. It's the way it is. You know, we're out of harm with it, you know, whatever. And, but we need to shift. So we kind of look at, uh, you know, when the shit and the stress happen and the, the stress was, how do we go into, where would we go? Well, more of this zone, the integral place. And then the question is, how do we get from point A to point B? So we need to know where we're at. We need to shift where we're going to shift to. Oh, this whole centered master place, this inner zone. Uh, and then how do we get from point A to B? And that's sort of the, the, the technology, the training, what we can do for that. And, and so that we are in a timing, tempo, rhythm, connection, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's part of our, I guess, the training and we can, we can go there some more, but, um, you know, and then we, what we've done is we've gone from sort of our, our brokenness or our separateness into a more of a wholeness and back to the oneness and wow, 
you know, great things start happening. We feel better and do better. So um, I don't know, I hope that helps as a sort of a summary and just a reminder of shalom and shalem, peace and wholeness are into, uh, you know, uh, interrelated there. Um, and it's based on this harmony, oneness, love, connection, uh, you know, identity we really have with one another. Yeah, the Aiki way, Aikido. And we got to do it. So yeah, there's a summary for you. Sounds like a good final salute. Shalom. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Ah. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I got the thank you, Clinton, so much for this great thing you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank